welcome to Resilience in Life and Leadership with your host, Stephanie Olson, speaker, author, addiction, sexual violence, and resiliency expert. Hello, and welcome to Resilience in Life and Leadership. I'm Stephanie Olson, and I am really looking forward to this podcast with Tom Dutta. He is an award-winning CEO, best-selling author, and radio film producer, transforming leaders and companies worldwide. Tom believes real change starts at the top. He is dedicated to changing our view of mental health in the workplace by breaking the silence, telling a story of struggle, and being a leader by example. Welcome, Tom Dutta. Well, hello, and welcome to Resilience in Life and Leadership. I am so excited to have Tom Dutta with us. Hello, Tom. Welcome. Hi, Stephanie. It's great to be on your show. That you are a man of many talents. You've got a ton going on. You are a speaker. You're an author. You're a podcaster. You're just a, so I, I, I'm just dying to hear your words of wisdom and what you have going on. So how did you get, let's start with your story. How did you get to where you are? <laughs> I was smiling when you said you got a lot going on because I'm just going to jump to the current chapter of the story and then we can go back. That sounds great. That, and thank you. I'm very humble about my bio. I, I, I'm really a storyteller and a thought leader. Uh, three years ago, I was doing what was called the Ride to Conquer Cancer. It's, mm -hmm. it's a ride that, that we do in Canada. And uh, a friend of mine's an engineer and his daughter passed, unfortunately, from leukemia oh, at age 11. Sorry. But yeah, they had been doing this ride for 10 years. And on the 10th year, Roger said, Tom, would you like to join our team? And he had 80 riders. And I think there was wow. 1500, 1500 bikes that day. And you know, like me, I just all about service. So I said, sure, I didn't even own a bike. <laughs> and so it was 225 kilometers, you know, you can convert that, but I'd never done a long distance ride. So it started in close to Vancouver, where I live. Uh, we cycled one day 120 kilometers. But the first night I stayed in a motel with my, my wife and I got in the bath of the shower. I slipped backwards, literally cracked a hole in the tub surround oh and got, got seriously, I have a, a very serious brain injury. And I didn't really know that I was concussed. Wow. I finished, believe it or not, I finished a ride and they told me I was crazy. But I remember saying, because my team captain said, look, if you, I said, there's, there's ER services every 10 kilometers, I'm just going to shoot a bag of Tylenol and go slow. And I remember saying to my wife, cause she wasn't happy with me doing it. I said, you know, the people who have cancer or died from cancer, they didn't have a choice. You had to fight for it, but I didn't know the seriousness of it. Right. So I've been recovering for the last few years. I still have double vision and cognitive wow. challenges, but uh, that's the thing that really makes me think about life. And, you know, I'd like to tell everybody that don't take life for granted because yeah. in a moment, like a heartbeat, it could, yeah it could change on you. There are some silver linings that came out of that. Uh, but, but by trade, I started out uh, right out of high school in the workforce. Uh, grew up in a pretty toxic home. My dad was a very bad alcoholic. It was quite violent. And at age 12, I remember he left me a letter and my two brothers, and then he was gone. And all the affairs and all the drinking parties, all of that, I seemed to be one of those that was resilient enough that I just found a way I immersed myself in, you know, I had a paper route at age 12 with uh, five in the morning and good marks in school. And, yeah. but uh, it was a horrible time of my life, but I left home and I went and started working and I climbed the ladder quickly. I did a Ted talk on this in February, 2020. And I said, I, I went quickly up to what I call the penthouse, but I, I didn't stop to take a look at all the floors in between. So I think age 21 manager, age 31 CEO, uh, did pretty much everything across five different sectors. And then life changed. I went through some changes personally. You know, first marriage didn't work, remarried, uh, expecting a, a beautiful son with my second wife, lost him preterm. Oh, I'm sorry. Then the magic and beauty of my daughter, which you might see in the picture back there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but after a while, we had three significant events in my life. And I had started at what I call the hero's journey, which uh, a lot of people may know it's Joseph Campbell's work. Mm. Joseph Campbell's is a studied uh, religion and mythology and came up with this narrative, which is actually the, the narrative on my podcast 
that we're all connected by a single thread in our stories. And that in the hero's journey, we, they call it the dark night of the soul, but basically something mm -hmm. happens. We hear is called to adventure. And then we go from the, this known world into the unknown world to seek. And I started seeking when I got into that sea level job, I was winning awards and stuff, but I had trouble relating to people because of my communication from my childhood. And uh, every time I get a pay raise, I was lost and thought, I still feel this hole in my soul. Wow. So that led to, and I'll just speed through this next part, that led to really over 10 years discovering that I didn't want to be a hired CEO being paid to, you know, build somebody else's dream. Uh, when part of that career I didn't like was firing people. Like, I think I terminated over 420 people in my oh, career. Wow. I was a turnaround CEO, so restructure, right size. Wow. And so I, I went to Holland, Michigan, and I met with a gentleman there named John, and he had a company called The Wisdom Link. Mm -hmm. And he said, guys like you come to me, Tom, you're sort of in that top 2% of maybe income earners or, or a job title. And he said, every one of you guys comes in here and you're, you're, you're just lost. You're, you're trying to figure out what's the meaning of this life. Well, I spent a day at dinner with John and he just said, tell me what you do. And I said, well, I, you know, I, I built companies. I, I coach people too. And, and I said to him, I said, you know, when I was younger, my mom used to say that people just want to be around you. Hmm. And I said to John, I said, I guess really I'd be just going along in my career and just developing relationships and, you know, quietly helping people and dealing with some tough things. And, and John said in that moment, he said, he said, kind of like a quiet, I said, kind of like a quiet warrior. And he said, you might want to hold on to that because that might be the title of your first book, wow. which, which actually <laughs> the way of the quiet warrior is, is my first book. Uh, but that, that meaning changed my life because I basically had everything up here and all the wisdom we put on a whiteboard and I created a thought leader platform. So I have an education company that I decided I'm going to teach people what I learned in my yeah. career. And I particularly to focus on some aspects of, of what I saw were human challenges or flaws uh, that people had in their characters. Mm -hmm. I also had decided to do just, just like you do just on a whim. Hey, I'm going to start a podcast. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know what it was. <laughs> and then that a safe place for people to come tell stories. Yeah. Uh, then I published the book and it did quite well and it's being made into a feature film now. And Oh, you're uh, kidding me. Second book's about, no, the, the screenplay's done. And, and then the second book is ready to be published. We're just getting the edit done and all this stuff started happening. Mm -hmm. And then the injury happened, the concussion. And I literally slid into the depression. I, my first suicidal thoughts and I acted this out of my Ted talk actually about wolves eating and being in my mind. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't really know if I could ever be the same again. Uh, I ruminated for a year. I ended up going and night stalking at Costco for two years and waiting tables at a restaurant for a year, mm -hmm. really running out of cash flow. And I'll tell you, it was through the fog of that. And people say, why did you do the TED Talk? Believe it or not, when I stood behind the stage to, to go out on stage, I had uh, impairment of my short-term memory. I couldn't remember lines. I had double vision and I was about to throw up <laughs> and I took six months working with a coach and things to get ready. And I almost quit yeah. twice. And I said, I don't know if I can do this. Uh, even now I have double vision. So nobody knows mm -hmm. unless I say it. So I, I, I get on the stage, but I remember saying that, man, it would be good to through this fog of a concussion, mm -hmm. meditate and, and start finding a reason for it. And so that my TED talk was called how leaders can lift the stigma of mental health. And for the first time, I revealed my true story of being a, a business leader, well-known, uh, coming from a broken childhood. And I remember saying in my talk that, you know, I, uh, I you know, I was broke, broken in my youth and I became a, a broken adult. And that ruled me because what people don't understand is, uh, trauma or anything that's unresolved can create thought patterns in our brains that you could be sitting in a boardroom or in a meeting room or, a, you know, waiting at a McDonald's counter yeah. and the world around you triggers you to relive things. So it, you know, I've met a lot of executives, leaders, managers who fall down on the job, yeah. who struggle for getting 
having communications relations with people and they don't know why right because all this stuff that's going on right. so full speed ahead we did the ted talk and then same thing while i was concussed and dealing with mental health i just picked up the phone and i called a, a friend who knew a movie company in the u.s and he had created a movie for a book he had written a fictional book and i said hey do you think there's any chance that that guy might be interested in my book and i said you know i got some time on my hands and he <laughs> and I, I i knew him he's a university professor his name is john he's also a, a ordained pastor and i really denied my faith when i was a kid so there's another chapter to that yeah john put us together and we started talking and then they said well you know why don't you send us some information on because i said really the book was written in 2017 but all the new parts of the story happened after and I thought I knew the purpose of my life and what my life was about, but I really didn't. I think right. God had to strip me one more time. I had it all and then I had to lose it all and almost lose my life. And then I finally discovered really what I was really here to do and focus on. Uh, so we wrote the screenplay over three years. It wow. was actually, the concussion was 2018. We started writing it the next year uh and we just finished the screenplay last last year uh in That's fact amazing. i just hold it up here and they made me a producer so i'm kind of like i don't know what i'm doing but <laughs> oh wow so That's the, the amazing so it's called the way of the quiet warrior and on my website we have actually we actually put together a trailer for the movie uh, a short trailer which uh i'd like it for people to see it's pretty powerful yeah. this the book is based or the 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 movie is basically of a me and of course the people in my life as a a guy who came from this beginnings as i told you and became a successful ceo but it's really telling my story through the eyes of someone who's dealing with we call them wolves in his head all the time and and so the main scene that the movie starts with actually i'm spoiling a little bit here but i wanted a powerful start to the movie when you watch my TED talk, if you haven't, I act out, I actually acted out at the beginning of my TED talk, my, my first thoughts of suicide. And I literally was driving from my home here out to what we call the Fraser Valley to a credit union, a large credit union. I knew the CEO and his, his executive team, and they hired me to do a workshop, uh, part of my education company. And I had just had this concussion so you know i was running out of money and i thought i'm going to try to do despite everything going on i'm going to try to do this one workshop and this is about a five-hour workshop and you literally have to engage and hold yeah a team of these are high ego high performing people right, right? so <laughs> right. but i never forget it i literally was driving in my car at a white four-door sedan down the highway it was snowing because it was january so snow is falling and i literally had this out-of-body experience i zoned out in my head and I envisioned myself walking into the forest because there's all trees uh, through the snow, uh, laying down my back, putting my briefcase on my chest and hoping and manifesting that wolves came out of nowhere and tore my body apart. Mm -hmm. And I closed my eyes and I was at peace. And I actually acted that out in the TED talk mm -hmm. and people, I think it freaked people out a bit until I Your said- Your TED talk's very powerful. Yeah. So I, but a lot of people who saw it didn't, quite connect that that was actually real thoughts and mm -hmm. i want to just say i honor anybody who deals with depression because it is one of those things you just can't predict but i started having more thoughts i had a thought of my beautiful daughter hanging by a rope in her mm -hmm. in her dorm room back east mm -hmm. and and then i knew i was in trouble and i had to get some help and mm -hmm. so for i've got a psychiatrist and for two years i've gone through cognitive behavioral therapy and i'm way much through that now in fact my wow. depression's probably not even there i've got anxiety i deal with because life still has curves yeah. um going back to the movie so this uh the, the 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 beginning will be basically that scene of the car and me going in the woods and then and then we'll be focused on a boardroom table where there's a bunch of people around it and each person represents a story and so oh, it'll wow. be back and forth throughout life. We're going to touch on themes of everything I've experienced in my life, mental illness, homelessness, 
uh, addiction to alcohol. I never was addicted to drugs, but I, I wasn't an alcoholic, but my dad was, and I certainly depended on drinks for the wrong reason. Yeah. Uh, loss of a child, I mean, the bullying, all that kind of stuff that you just go, hmm, yeah. if, we could, if we could do something that people would see that there'd be hope or there'd be give them a resilience or an understanding that when you're out there and whether you're at work or whether you're in the home, if you're around somebody who has had past experiences, trauma, we need to understand them. Yeah. We need to be tolerant and patient. We need to lift the stigma and not make us feel that there's something wrong with us. And so That's when right. I did the TED talk, it was the first time I actually came out on stage and I have to admit it was something I wasn't sure, but because I had built this thought leader platform, I thought, you know what? God's called me to, and that's another chapter of the story is my faith, but I've, I've got to do that. And, and I'm glad I, I'm glad I did because people are starting to come even to me and talk about yeah. their own little wolves. And, you know, when you're at the top, you can't talk about it because they think you're weak, something wrong. So here I am today, and this is where I'm at. I'm, I'm getting back onto some of my, my work again, but, uh, you know, just, amazing. it's a life's a constant story. <laughs> I, I love it. I, what, what courage and, um, and there, it's, oh, thank you. there's such power in that. And I can really relate to so much of what you're saying. So in my, my real world outside of podcasting, um, I run a nonprofit. I'm the CEO of a nonprofit that does, um, prevention education on human trafficking and social media. I saw that. I think that's yeah. pretty cool. Well, yeah, but <laughs> along comes, you know, all of that stuff and the imposter syndrome and the, the yeah. stuff, yeah. and it is, it can be very overwhelming. And, um, I too have struggled with depression and lost a child, lost four mm, children sorry. in, in utero and, um, and just all the things, but, and, and recovering alcoholic, all these things you're talking about. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I, I love what he's saying. But what I love the most is that we have this tendency to look at people and say, oh, they've got it all together. They're all set. Yeah. 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 And uh -uh. <laughs> no, right. I, we've got to, to allow people to be who they are yeah. and be open about mental health and mental illness and, and remove that stigma. Yeah. You, first of all, I'm so sorry about the, the things that you went through. I really believe that, uh, well, let me just make a bold comment that I think Oprah Winfrey would, would say she, I've heard her say is 90% of people. Uh, I think their research shows 80%, but get this everyone, 80% to 90% of people have some form of past trauma or, or, yeah. or have, have some brokenness. Right. So it's, this is the interesting part. I grew up in this horrible violent home. I was the kind of the black and blue kid for a while, but I used to think there was something wrong with me and everybody in the world was perfect. And it's, but you flip the narrative and you go, no, people aren't, people just don't talk about it because there's shame and there's embarrassment and stigma, but everybody has some form. That's I mean, right. if you run a company and it goes bankrupt or somebody steals from you that if you don't deal with past trauma, the thing I realized about what the word trauma really means, I know you, you have a definition uh, you can share with me if you'd like to, but I really hated that word trauma, trauma, mm -hmm, trauma. Mm -hmm. Trauma is really something traumatic that happened in your life. So if you had a, if you had, if you had a, saw somebody go through a windshield, uh, mm -hmm. their car in an accident, you experience trauma. Right. And actually, by the way, when you're doing the work you're doing, uh, which is so cool with the traffic and all, I didn't realize this till I started doing executive coaching and dealing with people who were train wrecks, secondary but there's secondary trauma. trauma. Yes. Yeah. It's like, we could write this <laughs> narrative and it's like, oh my God, I was, I met a woman through my TED experience who was a 911 operator and oh, she wow. literally ran out of her job and broke down and had a mental breakdown with PTSD, but didn't realize it was secondary trauma. So where was I going with this? Sorry, my cognition, sometimes no, I get you're lost. Good. In my, you're good. I, um, the Trump trauma really is like, okay, so I saw the person go through the windshield of the car when I was 12. But at various points in my life, constantly, I relived that. Yeah. 
that's what unresolved trauma is. And really everybody, you have to, I think everybody needs to have a psychologist or psychiatrist on their, on their care team. Mm -hmm. It's body, mind, soul. So I actually, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say I've probably been through 12 to 15 specialists who call themselves brain experts, yeah. but I actually didn't want to get a psychiatrist. Uh, and actually he's a friend of mine who's probably yeah. one of the best, but one of the reasons is, is because I think it was a little bit of, well, I was against drugs. Yeah. And so my understanding is psychologists can't prescribe medication. Right. Good psychiatrists do. But as I started studying through, there's a great podcast, by the way, that they told me at the brain clinic to listen to that I recommend to your audience called the Huberman lab. Hmm. And I think it's Andrew Huberman. He's a Stanford uh, brain neurologist, brain scientist, oh, okay. really. And, and he's a, really fascinating guy, very smart, but he talks about uh, neuromodulators, things like dopamine and yes. serotonin. So here's what I was taught. When I finally got past my ego, they basically were saying to me in the medical community, if you don't deal with your sleep, deal with your depression, your brain will shrink. And I was like, what? Your brain will shrink, huh? Your brain will shrink because our brains are made basically like plastic. Our brains sit in liquid. Our brains are made up of, uh, of fat. Most of your brain's fat and there's neuro neural nets, thought patterns and everything, but through what's called neuroplasticity, you can actually teach your brain to think differently. So change your thought patterns. Uh, I think as you get older, neuroplasticity is harder, but we can reshape pathways. But if you get injured and you sit and yeah. ruminate, and you stop using your neural path, your thought patterns, you basically your brain capacity shrinks. Wow. And this is why I highly recommend to I've learned so much and I, I don't want to be a know it all on no, your show, but no, I, I just all, all these, like my head goes on a journey every time these, we say something and yeah. there's another nugget I'll throw out there. There's a, a great app called brain HQ. And they told me to use it at the brain clinic and what it is, is, and they recommend it not just for people with concussion or brain injury, but for anybody as you age. And it actually are like playing video games. It's exercises yeah. to, and they all have scientific papers behind them. So they're credible. And I started thinking about this, like, man, it, I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. Just get on brain yeah. HQ one, once a day, do 15 minutes because if you're going through something in your life, you're isolated, you don't have the ability to go out and talk to people and you're not thinking as much. Maybe you're sitting watching TV and that's do something to teach your brain, keep your brain. You can, you can, can't, you can limit the risk of dementia, of uh, Alzheimer's, right. all these things by keeping the brain growing. So, so it was the, uh, it was really this thing about depression that it got me to wake up and realize that that's part of my mission is to help lift the stigma. But I real I realized from being at the top in my leadership mm -hmm. career that I was part of the problem because when, and I said this boldly in the talk I gave that uh, leaders at the top, they pretend everything's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, they crack emotionally often. So CEO there it's high pressure. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, thank you. It, it's so when I'm when I'm at the top, I had a board of directors of the company. I was last the CEO was was in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm out here in Canada. Little Tommy's in his island. You can't go to your executive team or your leadership team and say you know. And if you say to your sometimes arrogant boss is something about your head not being right, they replace you or they think you're weak. Mm -hmm. uh, there's even companies that have public stock, and when a stock price of a company fluctuates the any news about the ceo can affect the price of stock of a company so even if there's a saying and when the ceo sneezes the office catches cold if if i said if, if we my company leaked it out that i might have cancer mm -hmm. right the longevity of the company stability the, the, the company could become unstable especially if you're like a bill gates or you're like uh yeah uh, we lost we lost him too early the apple uh, joe jobs right. jobs so so of course, you know, leaders want to keep their jobs. Number two, there's stigma. So they don't talk about how they're feeling, but they, all of them have something they use to create dopamine yeah. that, uh, that brain chemical they need to feel good, alcohol, drugs, porn, uh, whatever. Right. It's, 
that's they find something. And when you go in the cone of silence and coaching and you talk to some of these people, they're brilliant. They're just like us, but it all comes out. There's they show up with blood on their shirt. They tell you about the weights. I'm overweight. I got diabetes. I'm on medication. Well, why are you overweight? Well, I, I eat too much. Well, how's your drink? Well, I finish the bottle every night, yeah. uh, cocaine, all of that. So you start thinking about the whole thing that who's the person in the company that has the megaphone that can actually be heard the most and has the most opportunity me, uh, to go into the media. You're right. running your not-for-profit. If somebody wants to know about your not-for-profit, they're going to say, let's go talk to the founder. Mm -hmm. So we have the megaphone. We have the voice. Right. We, we're always on the mics talking about our companies, our strategies, our vision. So I remember listening to an a interview done with um, the head of Walmart. Oh, and then okay. actually, I read an article. This is part of the, the whole thing I learned on mental health about uh, stigma and why I started saying I was part of the problem. So this article came out saying that Walmart is going to open uh, psychiatric or counseling services, mental health clinics hmm. in its stores. They're going to pilot it. I read the whole article through and there wasn't one comment by the CEO in that article. And it was a huge opportunity for them to say, yeah. I struggled with my own mental health at one point in my life. Right. And if I could find a door to open to go to get some help, I would have, or we have a healthy culture in our company and I want my employees to talk about right. their mental health or I didn't experience depression or anxiety in my life, but I walked beside somebody close to me who did. This article went on to say this, and then it went on to say, we're not sure how well this is going to work because how many people would walk publicly would want to be seen walking into a clinic in their Walmart? Wow. Okay. Stigma, stigma. Right. The same thing, the same thing happened with the, the, cause it went, once you go through this fog of re-examining your life, like I did, you start seeing things differently. And so the Starbucks one was they had this big employee event and the Starbucks CEO was being interviewed. I think it was a couple of years ago. I was just bragging about how, well, for the first time ever, we're getting 5,000 employees together by Zoom because it was wow. pandemic time. And we're really investing in mental health services for our employees. And I thought, great. Talk, talk, talk. The CEO had a perfect opportunity to say right. something so people would say, you're, you're just like me. It's okay to be not okay at Starbucks. And you're talking about your mental health, never talked about it. And yet we know probably somewhere in his lifeline. So what I started realizing is, is that, uh, and this happened when I went to Costco and was a night stalker. So like I said, I climbed the, the, the ladder too fast and never stopped yeah. on the ground floors. God took me, took everything away from me and put me back to be a stalker at Costco. Yeah. Now, this was the hardest work I'd ever done since I was a kid because wow. I lost 40 pounds there. I so I walk into Costco and I'm a night stalker and I got to tell this part of the story because I love telling it because it's, it, I walk, walked in there a very shamed, broken guy. Cause I, so I didn't even know how to dress. That's how ignorant I feel telling a story. I put on my black leather jacket, a, a black tee, which is kind of my, my, uh, my look, Your look, uh, yes. my quiet, quiet warrior. Very look. cool look. I love it. And there's a story behind that too, how that picture came about, which if you ask me, I'll tell you, but, but I walked in there with jeans on and, uh, I didn't even know, like I literally, it was December. I was running out of money. It was two months after the fall running out of money. Cause everything stopped. And my doc says, get out there and just do something physical with your body because otherwise you're, you're, you're not going to progress. So to everybody who's dealing with concussions, you know, work with your care team, but you, you have to stay and try and be active. Yes. So I get into Costco and I interview with this assistant manager and it's a huge Costco. It's probably one of the busiest. I, mean, I think their door count in an hour at this one locally where I live was 800 people. It's nuts. <laughs> and by the way, wow. add on top of that, the fact that we're in a pandemic. Yes. And, and it, it took them a year before mask mandates. And we got people coming in, really nice people and some really arrogant people. When coming up to our faces and purposely talking and almost like spitting on us because we were mirror masks and they're not, oh and they're gosh. getting upset and there's no social distancing or anything. It's like sardines. Right. Yeah. So now I'm in this fishbowl with pressure. The lights are hurting my eyes. I literally was working till almost midnight 
total sleep pattern change, which isn't good for mental health. Right. Didn't see my wife for two years because her skiff was opposite. Oh, my life sucked. So I lost 40 pounds, but that was from the physicality of it. And so <clears throat> something weird just started happening. And, and uh, I, I kept it quiet, but, and I didn't tell anybody who I was. Mm -hmm. So I get this interview with the assistant manager and I said, so tell me about yourself. And she it was amazing. And she said, well, I was a school teacher and I gave all that up to be here because they pay us well. They look after us well. And I kind of questioned the looked after us piece now that I've been there, but mm -hmm. you know, good company overall. And, and so she said, she looked at my resume. She said, you could run this warehouse. What are you doing here? Mm. And I got embarrassed because what I actually did was I went and applied at Starbucks, Home Depot and, and Costco online. I didn't even know what I was doing. Sure. And I dumbed down. I didn't put my resume in. I just dumbed it down. And I said, I have a little training business <laughs> and, <laughs> and I've done a lot of service things. Yeah. So I didn't say anything about who I was, but for some reason, maybe they just, she put two and two together. And I said, look, my dad, and by the way, six months before I had my accident, my dad died. Mm. So that's another whole story because wow. three months before that, I actually made peace with him and oh. connected back to him after 10, 10 oh, years apart. Neat. And then he died unexpectedly. So I never got to see him again. I'm sorry. That's all right. I mean, there was forgiveness and some healing that came out of it for me. So I, so I, she says, well, and she looks at me and she talks to me and I said, I just want to change the pace. My dad died. I didn't talk, talk, talk about my injury or anything because I didn't think they'd want me there. And she says, okay. She says, well, I just have to tell you, this is seasonal. There's not going to be any more work after. So it was December mm -hmm. as of January one. And I'm thinking like, I don't care. Like if it's four weeks and it was sporadic shifts, it wasn't even anything. Right. Minimum wage uh, from a guy who was making six figures all his right. life. Uh, it was really where I had to, again, through my faith, realize that, by the way, the people I believe would get into heaven, heaven are the one, not the rich people, that right. you have you have to be stripped of your ego because leaders have egos and going to Costco and stocking at minimum wage was exactly what I probably needed to see the world the way it really is. The majority of the world is run by people like the workers in Costco. So they're all, so she says to me, the last part of the interview, she says, um, I said, don't worry. I said, I'm fine. And she said, but you know what? Sometimes we keep on good people and, you know, and there were 16 of us being hired and she said maybe one or two. And I was going like, oh my God, like, <laughs> come on. I got no experience, you know, doing this work. I don't even know how to use a time clock. Like what yeah. is a time punch clock? Yeah. yeah. So she looks at me and I said, I tell you what, I said, I learned this just as a young man. I said, if I'm not in your top 5% of performers by the time I finish, I said, it, it, at any time before this January, I said, I want you to fire me. Wow. <laughs> and she, <laughs> and she, she looked at me and she just, and I was wondering what she's going to say. And she goes, oh, no, I'm not going to fire you. I'm going to hire you. Go get some steel tailed shoes and come back in a couple of weeks. And I got promoted three times there. They promoted me wow. to forklift driver after a while, uh, cashier. And, and all the older guys, a lot of the seniority there, it's not a union, but yeah. it's sort of that. Uh, I have one older guy came up to me and he said, like, he would never talk to me. And six months into the job, he came around, <laughs> he's Filipino. And he says, I've been watching you. He said, see all those guys over there? He says, I tell them, you should be like that guy. Oh, he said, they're all lazy. So this... So this is interesting because my dad, despite what he was a commanding officer in the military, he was a sloppy, drunk, violent, womanizer, all those things that I, I now say there's different meaning to his name, but I say that for context. But my dad, basically, I was raised in army, brought very strict, very tough, but high standards. And everything that my dad put in me and every tough thing that happened, I relied on at Costco to survive. And I got recognized, I got promoted. And I was just embarrassed because I wasn't, I didn't want people to know. Mm -hmm. People are starting to pick on me a little because I was getting like one guy goes, how did you get to drive forklift? That doesn't happen for two years. And I'm like seven months in the job. And I'm an older guy, like they're all young guys. And mm -hmm. then one day on a shift, I'm sitting in the lunchroom and this guy, uh, he was the one of the 16 that was hired and he was kept on, but he eventually quit. He's sitting beside me and, you know, he gets to know me and like the quiet warrior. I'm just saying, Hey, how's it going? What's, and he goes, can you tell me uh, 
can you tell me when it's time for break? And I said, why? He says, I can't see properly. I said, why? He said, because he said, well, he said, 30 years ago, my wife left me and took my son to this country. And I did really hard drugs and things. And he said, I have struggled with depression. He said, I give me, they have me on medication. And he said, I, I just, it affects me. And I went depression. Interesting. Every from that moment on, that guy just totally, there was no stigma. We taught, I said, you know what, dude, I, I'm struggling with anxiety and depression. I had lots of problems from a head injury. I said, how about we just talk about it whenever we want? I said, because I'm proud of the fact that you talked about it. When I went to work, it felt, it was amazing because people just, I said this in my TED talk too, as people want to just be able to talk about how they're feeling. Yep. I had never experienced that at the sea level. And all of a sudden it was like this freeing thing. It's like, I can say to this guy, Hey, I'm having a rough day or I'm feeling a bit anxious. Another guy comes up and they started listening to my podcast a bit and podcasts and getting to know who I was. And I all used to tell everybody, I don't want people knowing who I am because I'll get treated different. I said, I just want to fit in. So this, this other Filipino guy who's been there a long time, super nice guy drives a forklift. He comes over and he goes, yeah, he says, I heard you talking. He said, I'm on medication for anxiety. And he said, I had separation anxiety because I left my country, came here. Mm. Every shift, we would, on the way out, I'd give him a little hug or we'd give him a high five or something. Yeah. I treated him like he was perfect, perfectly, uh, in, perfectly imperfect because he was yeah. dealing with anxiety. But and there began to grow. And last story, yeah. there's a fe fellow who became my supervisor. As he got to know me, he opened up and he had dealt with, uh, he was dealing with um, ADHD, uh, dyslexia. Uh, and he grew up in a very tough home with, with women. And there was a bunch of abuse going on. He, he had chronic anxiety. Like this guy literally couldn't even come to work at Costco in the early part of his career. So he started talking to me and he said, you know, I'm a Christian. I just want to tell you about, you know, but he said, you know, I, and he opened up and then him and I just started riffing. And I went, dude, yeah. I said, me too. I said, and I said, by the way, 80% of the world deals with anxiety. Anxiety is just a, 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 an emotion. You worry about the past. You worry about the future. You worry that bad things are going to happen. That's normal. But when you stay there, then you have to get some, some help right. because right. there's ways, right? So all of a sudden, I go to this two years in Costco, then a buddy of mine is a CEO of a co-op. They bought a tap house, a restaurant in North Vancouver, uh, the other side of where I am. And he calls me up and he says, uh, he said, are you still doing the Costco thing? And he, we were fellow CEO. So it's like, I said, yeah. He says, well, I think I have a job for you. And I'm going like, yes, finally, this, somebody believes in me because all my other friends, nowhere. And that's the other you. thing you yeah. realize yeah. when there, people think there's something wrong with you. They, I'm not going to say this for negative. People don't know how to be beside someone that's who's right. going through. Yeah. It's yeah. not that they don't care. So he offered me a job and I said, what is it? He said, well, it's a table server. He said, I hesitated calling you, but it's at a restaurant we just bought. I went, I'm in. I said, day shifts, let me do it. So I go there and I, you know, I hadn't served since McDonald's as a kid. And I just started doing what I did a year uh, in there. And then I discovered that my double vision and things were really depleting my, my mental capacity. Cause when my, my eyes don't converge, okay. yours go back and forth. Mine yeah. get, mine stay. In uh, fact, I'll show you, I'll show you something. Watch my finger okay. and look at my eyes. When I do this, what are they doing? Your eyes? Yeah. What are they doing? They're staying straight. They're supposed to go like this. Yeah, you're right. So I have wow. double vision because when I fell in the bathtub, I fell on the vision center of my head. Ugh. So everything I do, reading, writing, wow. even podcasting with you, what's how, what happens is, and they've taught me this through brain, the brain clinic that my, my eyes are using, because your brain has electrical activity in it and it only has so much energy. So it's causing deficits in other areas like short term sure. memory and stuff. So that's my life. I got a disability decal on my car. People don't know about it because I mask it, but I'm right. doing things to try to improve it. But it was only going through, uh, I guess, the reason why I was telling you all these stories about what I did while I got concussed is like God put me into these two places where I was on the ground floor seeing what it's really like. So at Costco, there's people, <laughs> there's little families who were working there together mm -hmm. and they're like working three jobs. Wow. 
wow. there's you know and then then the same at the restaurant all these servers and they it's the hardest job yeah and yeah. some of them are single moms and dads but they're working two jobs and they're right. just they're just burning the candle and i'm going like you know we got it pretty good when i was a when i was in corporate america i got a pretty good yeah. paycheck for sitting in my office and i could create time and space for myself right. So all of that is really fed back into, you know, what am I doing currently? Well, the, the, the company that's still my education company is uh, still there and I'm doing some teaching again uh, and all the other pieces through my work. And then the movie, the movie part, just so your audience knows, you can find my website media page, but we're really at the, the funding stage, which I realize is not easy. That's so no fun, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> and and I you know they they make me producer and I said I don't want you doing this film without me having some creative expression sure. because and it's an indie film company which I really like so I got this role and then I went oh I now I know why you made me producer because I got to go out and find money <laughs> so we are looking for the about ninety thousand the the film will wow. get done we're gonna film it in Canada U S but. I had these visions. It's already on the table of going into Costco and doing a scene in the movie. Uh, and I told some of these guys there that were struggling. I said, I said, I'm probably going to be making a movie about my life. And, you know, how'd you like to drive by in a forklift and wave when the I scene or something? That. And the guys, going like, awesome. the guys are going, <laughs> the guys are going like, yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, I'm so excited. I got to tell you about the film a little bit more that yeah. uh, this is how, well, this is what, uh, a brain injury does to you you go through these these experiences where sometimes like if somebody said you know it's this thing is two years away you feel like it's like a, a month away so you get you start catastrophizing and worrying sure. because you lose track of time and space uh, i had vision balance gait issues and particularly the eye issues but one of the things with the film is is that we started talking about filming it so i was driving pretty hard the film team we would do zoom calls even though i couldn't uh, spend a lot of time on screen mm -hmm. so we already have the the uh the way of the quiet warrior title song it's been written by a major recording artist and performer in the u.s who is behind pretty much every successful country artist uh even faith-based music uh the guy's a legend he's worked with dolly parton and the greats so he came and guess what i met him when i became an author in nashville at my book reveal oh wow and, and he was sitting at a table his name's eddie anders he's sitting at a table he had like johnny cash look black you know the kind of rock star hair glasses he's a good looking guy and uh, you know he's probably about my age in his 50s or so and he just was kind and I went and sat with him and he said, well, you probably don't know me. And I said, yeah, you're right. And he said, here's my book. And it was called waking up dead. Oh my God. I had him on my podcast because this is what his story was. Imagine what I just told you. This guy is one of the biggest recording artists and performers. And he walks off stage one day and goes to his computer and Googles how to commit suicide. Oh my gosh. Then he actually, in the book, he, in on my show, he talked about it, but he actually went, he rented a hotel room, mm. he left his cell and everything at home. He went and he took tons of pills and stuff. They, through God's grace, I guess, they found him on the floor of the, 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 mot the mot hotel where he went. Yeah. And they didn't think they would find him because nobody knew. He, because he struggled with depression, he had take, tried to take his life. His church ostracized him. Oh. Because in, in the church, you know, you have to be walking in faith and perfect. And then some, some of those churches, uh. it's, it's wrong. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he comes full circle, right? So here, here's just the things that were going on in my head. I'm sitting here, we're doing this screenplay and I'm thinking, I want to, I want to make this film something that goes far and wide, but is unique. So we got to have a title track. And so I think, who do I know? Who I don't know. And I get all, I emailed Eddie and I said, Eddie. I said, do you want to know why you came into my life? So we start talking by email. I said, you want to know why you came into my life back then and told me about your story, waking up dead? He said, why? I said, because I'm actually going through that now in my life. I wanted to take my life. I wanted to end it because I couldn't see the future. And what you taught me and what you showed me through resilience and, and coming back, God save you. I said, I'm actually reading the Bible. I'm wearing a cross now to, to Costco. I said, it was that connection that 
that's why you came to my life. And so I told him about the film, what we were doing. And I said, how would you like to be part of this? Because I said, we're going to go big and wide on a film that has mental illness in it. And how yeah. he goes, sure. So he, he writes the, we go back and forth for a couple yeah. months and he writes the original words and the track. And if you twist my arm, I might, it, with a non, non-disclosure, send it to you. But it's, Ooh. we also have uh, a young man who, uh, this was referred to me by the movie company. He's a young fellow. Todd is his first name and he, he's done, get this, he's 47 years old and he's done musical scores for 50 films. Five Holy old. cow. <clears throat> this guy's a machine and he does something with his brain where he literally will, will get the orchestra and the things together in this big studio. And usually they don't get the screenplay until the day before. So that's how it works, which blew my mind. And he literally composes and there's one film I, I'll have to send you a link to his website because I, yes. I started listening to some of his stuff. So, so I said to Todd, I said, so Todd came on board the team and he said, uh, so my movie, my movie director, Josh Minning is, uh, they live close to each other. And he said, I got a guy who'll do the score. Mm. So I sent, I sent him the screenplay. We start talking and there's something about him. He's very quiet, very laid back, very creative, you know, uh, but there's a bit of a dark, darkness to just his temperament like and so we get on our first three-way zoom call with with eddie who wrote the title track yeah. with with todd because todd wants to take uh, elements of the title track and weave it into the score so you know when you're watching a movie and you have the musical score that keeps yeah. coming up in movie, yeah. but then there's a title track you hear that like the titanic right 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 so we get on this thing and we start trading stories and all of a sudden Todd's quiet because Eddie, I said, you know how I met this guy? Because he tried to take his life and we're both authors and he's an agent town. And I said, Todd, you've read my story. You know about my struggle since I was a kid with mental illness. Uh, and then now just as we're wrapping up, Todd says, well, I just want to let you guys know that it was three years ago this month that I tried to commit suicide. Yeah. And my, my mouth is on the, my mouth is on the floor. Wow. Another one. Another guy who we see as successful, successful. Yep. and, and yet I met his parents because they came on when I was live streaming, they came on to say hi to him. And I was thinking like, okay, what's your story? What he said to me is he, because he's done so much film work, he said, it really affects him when he sees movies that are very hard, like involving violence or trauma and stuff. He said that literally wires into him. <clears throat> and I guess. We all know that depression uh, comes from imbalance in some of these chemicals right, right. that are in the brain. So, so, you know, mm. so I'm think I'm stepping back now going like, really, mm. we got, there's, there's three of us now on this project that I didn't know. Mm. And then the last one is John, who's the professor pastor I was telling you about mm. John, you know, I think he's a pretty smart guy. He's educated. He's a pastor. He helps a lot of people. Yeah. He sends me an email one day and just shares with me. He said, I'm, cause I was having a tough time with my uh, anxiety, my medication. He says, I'm taking medication for anxiety. And this is a pastor telling me, and, and yeah. they don't talk about it in the church. Now it's starting to change. You yes. have to talk about it. But I went, oh my God, because John does funerals all the time. He sees so yeah. much stuff oh, yeah. and he's one of the, he's the kindest guy, but now I'm like, wait a second. There's a, there's, there's something from a higher universe here because I just decided to put a film together based mm -hmm. on an idea. And the initial team has four people on it yeah. that have those stories. And the last person on the team that just came, came on the, after a year was uh, Brittany Bexton, who is a Nashville entertainer performer. She's young. Uh, she's a wonderful lady, amazing voice. And she had a dream of being an actor and a singer, and she's done a couple albums one day because I'm posting on social media, I get mm -hmm. this email from Brittany. I didn't really know her. And she says, here, you can have any of these for your movie. And she gives me three songs that haven't been put on records yet that she's done. And she's, I'm going like, that doesn't happen. Wow. So I, I, yeah. I decide, I decide just to follow her and I find out she's written a book to my publisher and, uh, and it's a faith-based book, but her story is she has PTSD from abuse in her life yeah so i'm going like i'm going here we have how how odd is or how real does this prove something five people all not knowing anybody from the universe come together and they each have the story we, ne we never knew and yet 
the reason why we told each other is because there's no stigma. That's right. Because That's we, right. we're on, we're honoring each other's work. Uh, anyway, I could go on and on about film. You Gosh, can edit as beautiful. much of this out because it's just, but, no, but, uh, it. you know, I'll have you in the VIP list for, for the opening. And as we evolve, I, I guess maybe I'll, 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 I'll let you lead from here. Cause I know I burned an hour. I just, one thing I wanted to just talk about quickly. Yes. Before I we wrap. hear that. Uh, I'm going to do a shameless plug here. This is a magazine called Health, Wealth, and Wisdom. Mm. And you see it says TEDx there. Mm -hmm. we, I'm on the, or, uh, the leadership team of Western Canada's premier TED stage. Oh, so fabulous. we bring speakers through. We just had our lot. Yeah, if you go to uh, TEDx Surrey, S-U-R-R-E-Y dot C-A, that's where I did my talk. So we just filled uh, the Bell Center for Performing Arts, a beautiful theater, mm. a thousand seats. We filled it half because of COVID restriction, but yeah. we had... I think live streaming around the world, 30 countries, a couple thousand people, and it's growing. And so the the presenting partners this year, a uh, couple people I know in the Sikh community, the uh, South Asian community created this magazine. Oh, and it's all geez. about leaving a legacy of health, wealth, wisdom. But in, in the magazine, they, they featured a story on me and on all the TED mm. speakers. If anybody's interested in finding out more about uh, TED, a lot of people I know say, I want to do a TED talk, the advice I give is find a stage, even if you don't live where it is and, and try to watch an event if they mm -hmm. live stream. So that when you do apply for one, you have some credibility, right? The last book I want to show you is this one. And we may have to do another thing on this. And I never yes. talk about uh, faith, but I just want to say that it was actually through the darkness that I, I had nothing left. I, I had nobody, uh, even after making peace with dad and then he dies um, estranged from my, you know, one of my brothers has mental illness and I just, my kids are all gone and I just was lost. And it was actually one night I just sat down and go by me across and I would, I would get in the car and drive to Costco. And I literally like dummies for faith. I would just start talking to God. Cause I didn't even know what I was doing. I said, God, I, I'm just going to have this cross on you. Just keep me here at Costco. Cause I really want to get out. It's hard. You, you keep me here and I'll stay here. I'll, I'll wait for you to tell me the next move. Something will happen. Two years. And it was, I hated it. But it was that that kept me there and it led to other things. But it's really my faith that has brought me full circle with, and I believe people who, whether you're religious or not, if you have something you can you can say, there's somebody holding my hand no matter what. Yeah. My eyes are wrecked, but... It's going to be somebody's there for me. That's They're right. not going to forsake me. If I had had that when I was a kid, we had a picture of Jesus Christ on our wall in our house. But through all the the bad things that were happening, I used to look at it and shake my head. Yeah. I was baptized Catholic and all, and I denied it. But I just want to say to everybody that my care team today includes my faith. Uh, you have all these things around you. So, yeah. That is absolutely beautiful. And um, again, another thing we have in common, because that is, um, that is the thing that has given me a life of victory as well. Well, wow. um, yeah, he, he is Christ. So I, I love that. And the amplified version is a good one too. Yeah. It's got all the stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was able to find these cool things. I got my wife a set of these little wax uh, marker. So if you look at my Bible, it's all yeah, like it. It's all yeah. marked up. But I had this little because I'm goal driven. That's how I am. I said I buy. At one point in time, I want to make sure there's a marking on every page. But really, the Bible's it's a it's a story about Christ's yeah. life. Yeah. It's not there to lecture you and tell you what to do. But in it, I learned how to love people. I learned how to live a life that I wasn't taught when I was a kid. I didn't know how to do that. This, this book gave that to me and that's really, it's, it saved my life and uh, I'm quite happy about it. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. I, I could seriously talk to you all day long. Um, you have a fascinating story and, and you are a storyteller. You, you tell that so well. Thank you. Yeah. But I, w I want you on again, if that's okay. I would love to have I'll, you. I'll come back and help in any way. Oh, just, that is... just let me know when. That is fantastic. I have really enjoyed this. So I do want to hear about the story of your outfit 
on oh, your yeah. book. Yes. Yeah. So I uh, just show it again. Shameless plug. Yes. The way of the quiet word. By the way, the second book is going to be called Nobody's Ever Seen This on Live. Okay. It's called the, the Choir Warrior Teaches Genie. Okay. Uh, and what it teaches genie easy skills to create happiness. Oh. Uh, and the genie is actually a lady in California, Donna Sutherland, who is a D Disney style classic illustrator who started writing stories, fully illustrated stories to communicate her pain in her in her life oh, she went through wow. all sorts of things wow. and after my ted talk i uh she was doing an illustration for another book after my ted talk she sends me an email she says oh my god she said i just saw your ted talk your story is my story oh. and so she calls me and so now she is the uh, it's a funny twist on words cio the chief illustration officer mm -hmm. of my company and this book is co-authored, co uh, she illustrated, it's fully illustrated. Mm. And what I've done is I've got through my cognitive behavioral therapy, I learned uh, something like 166 skills on how to live healthy with mental illness. We've, I've taken 10 of them, I call them hacks. They're in the book. Mm -hmm. And then I've gone out and I've, I've got uh, six live people who have contributed their story about going through the mental illness curve. Some of them have pretty good, uh, uh, stories, one, you know, a few Americans in there too. So the book is going to be published this year by my publisher out in New York. And it was on hold for a year because I just couldn't even do anything, but getting back to the, the, the real question. So we, we uh, when we decided, when I decided to create the company, create K R E A T play on words. And then uh, uh, what we, what I wanted and we, we wanted was a brand that people would be attracted to for mm -hmm. the lifestyle health, uh, happiness, all that. And so we do this lifestyle uh, uh, shoot, photo shoot with a young fellow, Rob Trendiac, takes us to this old warehouse. And he says, oh, bring your bring your leather jackets and a few clothes. So we go out in the community and we do all these cool shoots. You can see it all on my website if you go to the Who page. And he says, oh, okay, put on your leather jackets. And he said, give me your badass look. And that was, <laughs> honestly, that was it. And then when, when, the, when the picture was proofed and all, I sent it to the, when I did my book, my publisher said, you know, we never put people's pictures on the cover, but he said, it looks like we've, we've known you for a while. And he said, the reason why is we don't get good quality. So we took a risk, we put it on the cover and then it kind of stuck, but there's a, there's a deeper story. I'll tell you the next time I see you, I learned that that look is actually armor. That look with the, is, was the armor I had on until I was stripped of it through this. So I, you know, now when I'm on, my, I wear my black t-shirt, but you know, my, I'm, I'm open and I don't have, I sort of, yeah. I mean, it's a metaphor for what happens when you have armor and then you decide to take it off. I love that. And you know, what just came to my mind, it's like you were stripped of that armor and then God put his armor on you. That's right. I mean, that is just yeah. so cool. I love that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very Thank cool. You. Uh, well, okay. So how do people find you, Tom? Yeah, it's very simple. My website has, it's w or triple w dot create. So you have to get this K R E A T plan words dot C A. Uh, there's a book page there. There's a media page, which has all my uh, ongoings and you can see a gap because of my injury, but stuff's coming back. Uh, and uh, you can reach out to me directly through that. The quiet warrior uh, show is my live stream podcast. So I'd love it if people just take a listen to that. It helps yeah. the show. Yeah. That's uh, and, and just stay connected on my social feeds to hear about the new book, whatever I can do to help people. I'm Absolutely. Here. Well, you're doing incredible work and I really appreciate it. And I love that you are really not only trying to talk about removing that stigma, but you're actively doing it. And that's amazing. I well, thank that. you. And I just want to return the same thing. Everybody, Stephanie's show, you know, what we, our stories get known as we give them ratings. Yeah. So please find her podcast, give it a rating, download thank it. You. And to you for sharing your, your past uh, adversity and what you're doing today. I um, mean, you know, you're, you're one of the quiet warriors out there. So just honored and keep, keep never stop. I love it. Okay. Final question. <laughs> and you kind of answered this, but what does resilience mean to you? Oh, goodness. I mean, I could be as simple as saying it's it's the number it's how you, it's getting back up uh, uh, after being knocked down. But let me just do another 
uh, riff on that, something different that um, there was, this is actually a real study was done in Canada and I use it sometimes when I teach a study was done of 90 year olds and they asked, what are your top three regrets at age 90? After everything came in, the first was we didn't risk enough. Number mm. two, we didn't reflect enough. Number three, didn't leave a big enough legacy. So re resilience to me is all is really in that, in that research. Uh, to, to, do, to do what I've done with my life, even escaping a home to try and get my life sorted out, you, you got to take risk. Uh, so many people in bad marriages and things say, oh, I'm staying because of my kids or whatever. No, you got to take risk. You've got to reflect. So if you hurt people and hurt people, hurt people, I've hurt people yes. in my life. If you screw up, if you fail, just reflect more mm -hmm. so that we can find learnings. And the third one is legacy. The only way to be truly happy and resilient in life is you have to go beyond yourself and then be in service to someone else. Mm. And for those people out there, I've heard these things talked about in fun ways. Next time you go to a grocery store, do something simple, like get a, get a shopping cart, put it back where it belongs. When you're doing that act, random act, you can't yeah. experience pain. And so I know a lot of people, probably you too, that get to the age of retirement and they have mental health or, or uh, health breakdowns because they haven't created anything beyond mm. their job and their family. They haven't created anything that is making a contribution. So wow. simple things, we can do simple things, yeah. so even pick up garbage around the community, but just everybody that's resilience, you know, those yeah. three things. Oh, I love it. Well, this has been <laughs> an absolute pleasure. I, I really you. appreciate it. And I hope this is the beginning of a uh, connection that goes forward because oh, we'll, we'll stay connected yeah. for, uh, for a long time. Absolutely. Very good. Yeah. And thank you for listening to Resilience in Life and Leadership. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Please share with anyone you think will benefit from this podcast.